Hi there, we're here in Reykjavik with Valger Sigurdsson and we're going to have a look where you work. Yeah, welcome to the greenhouse. <laughs> start start with the, the interesting the, stuff. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> like the closet of cables and interfaces and computers and drives and stuff that you want to keep out of sight. So there's, there's an upstairs and a downstairs. Yeah. And so then you've got a rig upstairs and a rig down here. Yeah, right? exactly. There's a B studio in there, the little the, uh, Neve setup, and um, the office there. And then we have a live room that is on this floor, but connects to upstairs where uh, the main control room is. And but everything is kind of you can get work in any room. We have a server okay. um, that we store like all the backups and all the projects from the past that, especially with the label, we have to have easy access to all, all that stuff. And it's a backup system that I try not to be too aware of at yeah. all. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, lucky to have other people managing people that. Managing that, yes. brilliant. Down here's the uh, office. It's where the bedroom community headquarters and, and greenhouse operation is run from. Fantastic. Colin and Ben. Hi, how are you doing? How are you finding vinyl sales? Increasing. I mean, um, and the interest is definitely there. Um, we we started doing more and more on vinyl. The problem now is becoming that um, it seems to be so popular that um, lead times are really long yeah. and you have to wait four or five months before a pressing is ready. Yeah. So. That's that's a problem. But How many releases have you had with? We with have uh, we're up to twenty five wow. now. Um, yes, so that gives us two and a half on average a year. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years ago, and I think they're there in, in chronological order, all the CDs. But we haven't pressed everything on on vinyl. Should we go through to the mm -hmm. live room? Wow! So the live room, like any other room, you can kind of record or sure do sort of it's, quite, this is, it's quite very bright sounding yeah. It, yeah it's a bright sounding room with quite live acoustics and we've got um, go button panels that we can kind of screen off and make make the room kind of that if we need to or the piano is now sitting in the middle it was put here for um, for a concert actually so we do okay. little performances What's in here the piano this is an old uh, Broadwood and Sons from okay, the twenties. I think it came from the oh, from the university cafe. It had just been kind of sitting in the corner, and it has a really nice um, round woolly character, and a character of its own. It, definitely, yeah, yeah. M I much prefer that in in a st in a studio than you know a Steinway that nobody can afford. And sound perfect, you know. Yeah, like we completely. Can, we can go somewhere else if we need that sound. Is it me, or does every <coughs> recording studio in Iceland have a harmonium? I think it, <laughs> it might not be you. It might be true that every studio has one. This is the only instrument that was like, this country had for. Right. Like every every home would have uh, an organ, so you could kind of on Sunday sing and and play the organ. Um, and they, I think, most of them came from Germany or, or Denmark. This is the, the um, church kind of um, okay. version, but the Indian, I, I think there there is a... It's a genus, isn't it? Harmonium, it means related, a certain related, kind of thing. That, it's related, yeah, yeah but it, it's, it's, a, it's, you have all the kind of um, organ stops that you would in a, not all of them, obviously, yeah. but a few of them, the same, the, the same um, names, like they're all here in, in German. And oh, I see, okay. And if we had my friend Jamie here, he could tell you a lot more about organs. But <laughs> <laughs> he's a he's a church organist, but uh, and has played played this instrument quite a lot. And also, he loves this old Yamaha. Excellent. That um, it, it, it's still on the same principle. It's just like a home organ, cheap. It, it, it's cheap to buy now, but I think this kind of re in in the eighties replaced. This, gotcha. So a lot of these became kind of people wanted to get rid of them, and and but everyone had like this new fancy thing that had a, also a drum machine. And I remember actually having access to one of these and recording onto cassette just the drum machine at like 
the rock preset yeah. in a few different tempos where I could play along on my guitar and listen to the drums on the cassette. And you, you've got some backline, do you do much reamping and stuff down here? Or? Yeah, a lot of yeah. uh, reamping, both with uh, different amps and just in, in the Dynaudios into the room, just using the, the, the uh, acoustics of the room, um, both up here, down here and, and up there. But um, oh. reamping is some, certainly something, and, and, and the character of this room, just as a, as a space. You know, right. it's something that we use quite a lot. Guitars. Shall we go upstairs to where mm -hmm. you? Yep. And then uh, step into the control room. Wow. <gasps> Look at that. Awesome. So how long have you been here? 16, 17 years almost. Wow. Yeah. And is it kind of purpose built or did you? Yeah, the space was just one open uh, space. There was an artist workshop before I came here. It's a kind of, because like in the 1980s and 90s, I'd go to studios and you'd walk in and it'd be like your brain was being sucked yeah. out of your ears. And that, I think people's attitudes have changed about that. And what's your, as a, from an engineering point of view, what's your feeling about this, that not working in totally dead spaces? Yeah, I prefer it so much, um, yeah. especially if you're spending long days yeah. in, a, in a space, you just need the, both for the, I think for the air quality, not to be kind of in a, in a dead room that you have to rely on air conditioning. So I just open the door into the garden. Sure. We're in a quiet area so that... And I, I hear you're course. not totally isolated yeah, as well. No, yeah. I mean, the door is open now, but the, actually you can hear the rain on the, on the roof sometimes. Right. And I just wanted to keep it like that. And, and um, I just prefer it for, for somewhere. I, I wanted to feel more like a, a living room. Kind sure. Of, and do you find it translates okay for you, or have you got used to it? And I've got used to it. I find that pe when people come in here for the first time, there's sometimes it takes them a bit to get adjusted to, okay. like, hearing the room. Yeah. Uh, because you definitely you hear the room. Yeah. And and the reason that I also wanted to keep it um, a bit live is because I like doing recording in the control room, and in okay. a big room like this, putting up drums, having a vocalist, string player like next to you is something that I value a lot. It's something that I really, like 10 years of working with Spitfire, the room, the, the performances happen in, it's just so vital. Mm -hmm. You know, we really take it for granted. And again, going back to like the 80s and 90s, it's just like lock off any room sound. Yeah. And violinists, they just can't, they can't hear themselves if, yeah. you, if you do that, you know. As I can imagine in here, it's, it's awesome. And I, I imagine a lovely space to listen back to stuff as well. Yeah. You know? You've got a, 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 an SSL. Yeah. So the desk is, yeah, I guess the, it's kind of everything is kind of built around the yeah. desk because the desk is an SSL AWS 900 24 track analog desk um, with the classic SSL EQs mm -hmm. on every channel. So try to do mixing as much here as possible. Either and the all important yeah and the, and the bus compressor of course <laughs> and, and the signable uh, dynamics. That because the like the bigger desks they have um, dynamics on every, every channel, channel yeah. whereas this one has you can, you can dial in the the dynamics from here and and of course you use a combination of the outboard dynamics or plug in sure and, so you don't really need to uh, spend that you know money on twenty four uh, compressors that sit there and uh, maybe get used once, once a year <laughs> yeah. yeah and you got the, the, a drum kit in yeah. And I, I actually like this room to be quite sort of fluid and, and flexible. And I just sometimes I just set up a writing station on this desk with the, the other screen on this side. And I, I like face this side sure. all, all day and have two mon uh, speaker monitors here. Right. So depends a little bit what I'm doing, what yeah. I'm working on. But when I built this room, I wanted it to be a room that anyone could come into and feel comfortable in. And I wanted it also be, to be, feel like a very personal um, writing and production space for me. Yeah. But when I'm away, when I'm not here, or when anyone wants to come in and work here, they can sort of set the room up more or less the way they like it. Um, it's kind of never the same, except that the desk stays here, the outboard is where it is, everything else kind of moves around, wow. like guitars or keyboards or anything that people are working with. So BM15A, is that what you... You're on most time, or are you on 
He's most. I'm happy. on the Dinodias more. Though. Yeah, yeah. With the. You've got to, life has got to be happy, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to be happy on those. <laughs> I've always had a pair of Ennis tents, yeah. and I think I always will. Okay. Yeah. And so. Quick reference. Yeah, well, yeah. For I mean, and actually, I heard them in a new way. I was in a studio in France the other day, and someone had. Um, Someone had designed the subwoofer speak, uh, system for the NS10s, and, and they actually sounded amazing. I'm, I'm still, I'm, I think I'm planning to do that here. Okay. And then so maybe that will become the main monitors. <laughs> <laughs> and is that a subwoofer for the BM15? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a foot switch, so I can uh, can turn it on and off. But and so, do you have a set of 15As for the centre and surrounds, or 5As, or? Yeah, 15. I have yeah. uh, three more 15s, so centre right. surround. And um, they're easy just to plug in. Plug in. Everything so. is set up at the back to Excellent. put them on stands and, and put them in the room. So do you, are you kind of mainly in the box? I see you've got a lot of outboard. Are you, are you, um, well, what's the best there? Again, it depends quite a lot on the project, what I'm working on. For tracking, all of this gets used quite a lot. Okay. So everything always starts with an EVE. Okay. I have eight channels of... Um, Four ten seventy three, four ten eighty fours, and they are my go-to preamps and EQs for my first eight channels. Okay. For almost everything I do, and then from there I move up to the channels on the on the SSL, mm -hmm. which have a great sounding preamp as well. And but that EQ I prefer m b better for mixing. Yeah. Um, the Manley I use mostly for mastering. Or, or for EQing the, the mix. Sure. Um, Focusrite has, an, has a nice preamp too. And two channels of, of uh, quite a different EQ that is useful. Um, everything passes through the patch bay, very okay. importantly. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's never any like running behind the okay. racks to, to plug things in or out and, and, and find cables. So, um, so you say it's kind of quite a like, relaxed space, but everything is properly... And that's part of the space being relaxed, because we spent a good amount of time planning and preparing and then wiring everything. So even to the point where the little B studio downstairs has 16 tie lines up here, so I can use the Neve desk that is down there, or down there we can plug into the extra Neve channels or any of the outboard sure. here. here. But that's so easy when you have it all in the patch bay. Of course. And yeah. it's a lot of, it's a, it's a big investment to have a patch bay like this, but, but in a studio where you want to be both kind of clear of the clutter and you want people to be able to come in and do the projects without kind of ruining your setup. Sure. It's all there. Now that's a question I was going to ask. Yeah. Do you have redundancy built in, in, into it? There was. There, <laughs> I think we're <laughs> almost full now. Almost there. I think there's two here. There's two here. <laughs> Uh, I think that's, yeah, there's four here. That's because the API rack, we haven't filled the four okay. slots there. So they're waiting to get filled, but it's, it's getting He close who to dies it. with the least blanking panels <laughs> wins. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a, it's a line hanging here for the space echo tape delay. So everything kind of has a place. Even though it's not fixed, there's a thing coming out somewhere that sometimes I forget where I'm sure we had a headphone line coming out somewhere, but Right. And then we find it three months later, but it's <laughs> it's all kind of planned. <laughs> and I see you've got some of the, the usual suspects. These, I imagine, there, you kind of run on uh, loops and stuff. Well, um, yeah, the this is kind of the Noah's Ark of compressors. I, yeah. Kind of two of all the good compressors that I like. Yeah. Except the distressor, I got four. Uh, the, the stressors are so flexible, you can kind of make it sound like other compressors, so I, sure. I thought yeah. it would be a good idea to have enough of them. Um, yeah, I use them in the, in the signal path when recording, um, just for com committing to a, a compressed sound, or just the LA-2s especially, just as a little slight limiting. I understand. Um, just kind of 2 or 4 dB. And do you um, have a preferred uh, kind of setup for vocals, or is that something you do in the box? or? Um, my go-to vocal setup is always through the Neve, through the LA-2A, right. into the, into, straight into Pro Tools. Okay. That's my, the first thing that I try. Sometimes I move to the 1176 or, um, 
or almost no compression if depending on the vocal but uh, and, and depending on the mic but that's always the that usually find it tends to be my chain I, I imagine well I, I know that kind of a lot of people who are maybe composers who aren't engineers or people who are starting out who don't have a engineering exper exper experience the idea of compressing to tape or to tools is pr quite a I think we live in an age where you want control and you want to be able to change things right to the very end mm -hmm. the idea of committing something uh, like that is probably quite a scary one why why would you compress before it's good to spend a good time a good amount of time on the setup and then you can kind of let the the, the you can think about the music yeah. so having a little bit of uh, limiting on, on something if you don't know exactly what the dynamics are going to be just for kind of not overloading for example sure. or if you want to compress the overheads of a drum kit just to get that sound sure. you, know, you can and it, you can use it, it as you the can, you can get a kind of a, a slightly hotter level to, to tape or tools well that is not that important anymore i guess right. but having come from that time where you know i used to work with this when, when was the last time Last year, oh, good, I mean, it good. Gets, no. gets used every now and again, but not very, not very often. But occasionally, something is tracked to it, but then moved into Pro Tools. Of course, of course. Yeah, but it's still, it still, it sounds. It, yeah, <laughs> it's there and it's uh, it's working well and and yeah, it's a it's a nice friend to keep around. And so this is the brilliant like vintage digital rack. Do you want to start, is there yeah, stuff that you're the, still using that? The H3000 especially okay. is, is a great um, unit. Just, um, I mean, it's the original Eventide harmonizer that you know many people have used. And what is it that uh, Tony Visconti said? Fucks with the fabric of time. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And it's just a fun, fun box to um, play around with. The TC units are, are really good. The 5000 reverb is it's great. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like um, the Lexicon 480. Okay. Is it the VSS3 um, algorithm in the 5000? I wonder. No, it's pre. Pre it's that. Pre that. Okay. But then the 3000 came out later. That might have that. I'm not sure. Because okay. that's awesome. Yeah. And and the um, the fire. <laughs> What's it called again? Fireworks with a with an X. Right. Um, it's a fun, sort of multi tap delays and all kinds of special effects that. I've used quite a bit through through the years, not so much anymore. But there are there are pl good plugins that do a similar thing. Yeah. The A3 actually, the Korg A3, it was a guitar unit, guitar like a m guitar multi effect that right. had has great like digital distortions and kind of extreme. Which sound like digital to yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like them yeah. having a go. Yeah. It's like almost bless, mm -hmm. but then amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. So for that, it's, it's great. But you are still, you're also using a lot of plugins in the box. And, I do, yeah. yeah. A lot, and a do lot you have any preferred? I mean, I, I use whatever is quick. Sure. But um, then, then there is stuff that I, I, I use the Wave stuff a lot, okay. actually. Yeah. I have a love hate relationship with it because the. I love a, I have a love hate relationship that I, I own about two hundred Waves plugins, and I only use three. Right. So I love those three, yeah. and I hate the fact that I've, I've yeah. convinced myself I need to own all well, of them. Well, they've convinced you, <laughs> <laughs> you need to buy all of them. <laughs> I think that's the hate part. Yeah. Well, um, but um, no, that, I think I think they're they sound really good actually. Yeah. yeah. They, they've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. They? On yeah. to the the fun stuff. I noticed you've got a Jupiter 4, which is my favourite Jupiter. And, uh, it's mine too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I don't think many people know about, really, how, how great it sounds. I always maintain it's because it looks like a, like a, like a home organ. Yeah, it? and that's what uh, it was built for. It right. was, had all these presets here at the front. With the, I think it was one of the first synths to have. You could program it and you can... You can uh, store them in memory, you have like eight compu memory things that you can sure. have your preset that you've made yourself. And then the reason that they're here at the front is that it was designed to sit on top of a piano. So like an upright. Yeah. yeah. You're playing the piano and you have your uh, machine on top and you can kind of program it from the front. So you can quickly like move between sounds. Um, but it's just really fun to 
to uh, come up with sounds on this one. So. Yeah, it's got a, it really got a beautiful fatness to it as well. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. The filters are great. It's just a it's a nice sound. A mini move that looks like it's seen. Since yeah, that's some, been some around. Battles. It's been around and it's been used a lot here. Really? Yeah, I've had it for about fifteen years maybe. Uh, this is the Arc Odyssey. Of course, right. Um, and it has some weird modifications on it. It has all these yellow labels on it. Brilliant. So um, it does kind of unexpected things sometimes. Um, it's hard to program. I find it quite hard to program. But if you spend enough time with it, or if you kind of stumble up on a good sound, it's it's great to capture that and just record it in, and you'll never find it again. Yeah. Or I, I find at least not Absolutely. with this one. I think. Maybe because of those modifications, it, it's temperamental. It yeah, and I see you've got a J JX3P, which is mm -hmm. one of my favourite yeah. Roland's, and you've got the programmer, which I'm very the, jealous of. Yeah, the programmer is uh, the best thing about it. Well, I mean, the presets are great, but it, it's really easy to to tweak the sounds if you if you go to a preset that you is close to what you're looking for, and the program is kind of. Okay, I see. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you get the idea, but then if you have the box, then you can actually plug it into the synth. And this, I had this when I was like 15 uh, as one of my first keyboards. Sold it to buy something else, as you do. And then um, um, one time in a bar in, in downtown Reykjavik, someone came up to me at three three in the morning and said, "I know your sister. We went to school together. Don't you do music? I have some. I have a keyboard that I never used. Do you want it?" Brought it to me the day after. A few years later, awesome. I found the keep, I found the program in, in in a store in New York. And but again, I don't obviously. think these are on people's radars really. But no, I, I always say they've got the presets that are really excellent shit sounds. The yeah. kind of shit sounds Tom York would uh, use and stuff. Yeah, I'm almost more interested in in these like kind of cheapy yeah. ones that not everybody's after. Yeah. And, um, I don't want to pay a, a lot of money for an old synth just because everybody else has it. No. Or it's like fighting over it on eBay. Fight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> talked about it. Now, this looks fascinating. What is this? Is it? Yeah, yeah this looks like, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an electric piano. It's a Wurlitzer piano, but it has a special uh, box that is a, it's a rarity. And I, I heard that it was either built as a limited edition release, limited to 100 copies or something, and then the other story, which I kind of prefer, is that it was a um, cruise ship edition. Looks like and it's, it's called the butterfly model because of this, obviously. Okay. Um, it has exactly the same um, electronics and insides and keyboards as the, the standard ones that you see in the plastic 200 sure. Wurlitzer. The only difference is the, the case and the speakers, but it sounds, when you plug it in, it sounds exactly the same. How incredible. Brilliant. It's a beautiful piece to have. It is around. lovely, lovely to yeah. have there. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're obviously here in Reykjavik. Um, you've worked all over, is, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And I still do quite a lot okay. of work outside of here. Um, but before I built this place, I kind of had the good fortune of being moving around the world quite a lot in different studios so I could pick and choose what I would like to kind of bring into my space when I was building my own space. So, so um, I've kind of, it, and I, I still li like going to other places to work just to get, a, you know, another perspective, um, different inspiration. Um, but I prefer to do all my mixing here. Um, writing obviously I do here, but for recording it's sometimes nice to be able yeah. to go somewhere else. And there's, I'm, I'm probably, I, every time I speak to someone from Iceland, they always say, this is the question we're always asked, but there's, there's, a, there's something special here in the music scene, isn't there? And, and what is your, your take on that? <laughs> is that the question you're asked every single time? Yeah, I guess so. Um, in the different sort of slight okay. variations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Um, I mean, it's a small place. Yeah. People know each other closely, and, and you run into people who um, work in different types of music all the time. So um, things overlap quite a lot, and 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 mix easily with people who play in different with different types of music. It's very easy to like. You're not kind of in a 
in um, in, in a little hole with people who only play like hardcore music or people who only play classical music or people who only play electronic music or there's like all these um, all these things mix quite easily here because there's not many people yeah <laughs> and you and it's a small small place with a lot of music so um, I think that's maybe one thing that yeah that is quite unique and 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 um, Good about being a musician here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, listening to your output, I don't know if this is a fair summation, but um, I detect a, a spirit of adventure in everything that you do, whether it be using. I mean, I've, we've not seen each other for maybe 10, 15 years, but I remember with my brother's band, it was there was a kind of a, an excitement about pushing gear to its limits, making stuff do what it's not designed to do. Right. But I've also heard instrumental work where, again, it's, it's, I mean, unconventional is such a boring word for it, but there's, to me, is a spirit of adventure. I don't know if that's a fair mm -hmm. observation of your outputs. I don't know if... I, I hope so. I hope so. Um, and if, if there's any um, explanation or, or reason, it may be that there... They're like working in this environment. There isn't the music industry that kind of expects something from you. Yeah. So you're not trying to ever kind of fit into anything that is, um, you know, you're not making music to get them into charts because they don't really exist or they, there's no like, um, like you kind of make it for your own enjo enjoyment. And if you can, uh, like many of us have been able to in, in the, recent years to kind of go around the world and get our music sort of uh, heard by, by more than kind of just the local people, yeah. then um, I guess the, the, there's no reason to try to fit into anything else or, or, or I, think, I think it's a, I, I think this place kind of encourages just um, imagination and, and just do whatever you want to do. And enjoy the process. You know, I, I've, I've seen in, in uh, there are certain kind of songwriting houses where I don't know if it strikes me as a particularly enjoyable process. It's, it's very like high pressured and stuff. Mm. But it's always struck me that you've possibly enjoyed the process, the, the, the journey. It's not just the right. It's not just aiming for the, the chart <laughs> position. You know? I really, yeah, and no, I try for yeah. sure. And, and yeah, and that's I think a lot of a lot. Um, has to do with like choosing the people that you work with yeah. and because I'd rather work with and, and, and the same when I'm playing live or touring I'd rather tour with people who I enjoy hanging out with and, and f with a label veteran community it's, it's about kind of a joyful exchange rather than um, let's get into business together sure well let's talk about bedroom community because that's another kind of I think a fairly adventurous approach to uh the business and, and would you want to take us through that how that that whole thing was born and, and mm -hmm. what you're doing with that yeah bedroom community grew out of um so uh, basically out of a need to to make music with a couple of my friends and make my and starting to kind of seriously focus on my own music as well and and that was 10 years ago actually with 10 10th anniversary this year wow. um so we started and having the facility to record and produce and, and do all the things. I, I was uh, working with people that I, I heard their music. This is Nico Muley and Ben Frost in the beginning. The three of us were sort of the collective that formed Petro Community in the beginning. So I thought I wanted to get their music produced in a specific way uh, and and I thought that as three of us kind of contrasting and, and, and people who liked to um, work on projects together and do things just um, out of the need for doing them, I felt that maybe we should have some kind of uh, structure around this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Better Community was born and gradually that sort of extended um, to projects that we 
brought in with other people through kind of connections that existed or were created. And so now we're about um, 10, 12 artists on the label. We've, um, we release two, three albums a year maybe. This year, probably a bit more, and next year, because of, there's a lot of like new stuff that everyone's working on. And, and um, um, yeah, Patron Community is, uh, I think, has sort of become the thing that I spend most of my doing, most of my time doing, um, either producing or mixing the artists that are on the label or, or doing my own. Right. own composition so so it's become kind of more than just that little playground it has sort of become a thing a thing yeah <laughs> i love that word a thing, <laughs> a thing yeah and, it, and and there wasn't a plan really yeah. for it to become a thing it was just to, supposed to um, take on whatever uh, some of the best things to. were never planned to be a thing yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. that. this echoes in Spitfire would have never dreamt right. of, of yeah. going that way and and in so doing uh, it's almost like dogs finding each other in the park you, uh -huh. know, you suddenly find like-minded people um, yeah. which is very interesting but that leads me to my next question I think is a really important one is you must get uh, submissions from young people and uh, what do you <clears> say <throat> piques your interest and what advice do you have to young people when it when it comes to well, a lot of people, we all know it's about, you know, create your own voice. Mm -hmm. Younger people don't necessarily know that. But if that's a piece of advice to you, you give, what else do you suggest to people who are starting out creating something of their own, something that would pique your interest? Um, the thing is, I'm never really looking. Yeah. Um, so, but I like to be surprised. So, um, so I would, uh, you know, as a piece of advice to to anyone making music today, and, and it's just to get as much experience and, and just get your get your hands dirty and work with as many people that you can learn from as you can, because that's sort of how I've learned everything. It's just working with different people and and picking up things as I go along and and just learn by doing it. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, obviously. Um, as you said, just do your own thing and, and try to kind of find what that is. Yeah. Um, and don't be afraid to just, you know, change your, yeah. your mind if you... I um, have a thing that I say to people before they become parents, mm. is it make the most of being able to leave the front door because it's one of those things that becomes incredibly difficult when you have children. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a metaphor for, I think when you're young, it's the opportunity to get out and travel mm -hmm. and really experience things. And I right. think you do, you know, I think that the people with these computers and these bedrooms and stuff mm -hmm. become quite introspective and sometimes quite arrogant in mm -hmm. what they know and what they feel to be right. But yeah. there's so much to be learned. Every time I come in, and you know, to someone's studio or yeah. watch someone work on the same piece of software I've been working with for 20 years, yeah. I learned something new. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said That's for that. It's true. And um, I, I can't actually imagine what it is, but it must be uh, having all the possibilities in front of you in the box that I remember when I, and I'm not being nostalgic or anything, but like going to, uh, for the first time when I, I went to SAE in London when I was 19, mm -hmm saw the SSL and Neve desks for the first time, didn't have any access to the outboard gear that most of it didn't exist or wasn't around me. And so going into a big studio and seeing all those things and I, like, that's a Poltec. What, it, what does it do? How does it work? And now you can actually get that up on your screen. You can really, and it, I think it's a, a good thing as well. You can actually learn the equipment without having the actual physical thing in front of you. But I can't imagine what it, must be like now to kind of have access to all that stuff in virtual reality and, and kind of then do you think that you like know how to use all of that or because yeah. I think when people come here um, who are very used to like working in the box and they look around they get really intimidated by actually all the all the options um, where they yeah I don't know I don't know where I'm going with this but no, I'm, I'm just I, saying like it's yeah, I think I think you're right. You just uh, just like watch 
that this is why we have interns at the studio because they um, they help us out a lot. Number one, make the make everything run really smoothly, and they can learn from doing actual projects mm -hmm. with actual musicians, with actual people who are making music for a living all the time. And so I think that's the best way to learn is to watch someone yeah. and be inspired. I think one of the great shames of of the kind of pop majors business is that you know life is over once you're 25 and in fact as a 45 year old now uh i've started to reflect on some some bits that i did maybe 10 years ago and mm -hmm. going actually with time that's yeah. something I, I need to revisit that's interesting but you can only judge these things over time yeah you know? yeah it's absolutely fascinating yeah, so, so i was having a conversation about a piece that i wrote two or three years ago we got some award for it and and they were asking, so is it going to be performed again? I was like, no, it's probably too complicated. So never going to. I'm more excited about making the new thing. Besides, there's so many things that I want to change about the old thing, that last thing that I did. Um, and he was saying, this is a composer, an older composer. He was saying, my experience is that you never, you can never judge a work until it's at least ten years have passed. <laughs> <laughs> you hate That's it for the, for the first few years, then you're kind of okay with it. Yeah. You can actually understand it 10 years later, if, yeah. it, if it was a good piece that you... And then you just <laughs> remaster it by taking a bit of top off, because your ears were so tired <laughs> at the time. Um, one last thing, I, I believe you've just finished an, an album. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm just finishing my fourth album. So um, released my first one 10 years ago. So. Gradually, I'm, 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 I'm writing more and more music, and I've written a lot of music in the last few years. Um, although I, my last release was in 2012. And this new album is, um, is um, quite a big, epic album for me. It's uh, orchestral music that I've written, um, commissions partly, and then a new piece that is uh, based on an old, um, on a Mozart, uh, like a few bars of Mozart that I've taken and, and and um, extra expanded into a 25-minute piece. Um, so uh, and then so so half of the album is is orchestral music that I've recorded all here at the studio, but um, in layers. Okay. So I right. recorded a few string players at a time, um, overdubbing, building, layering, take doing this brass and woodwind and percussion separately and harp and piano and everything, and then. It's like a million tracks, and then I've had um, um, those pieces are, are both uh, written for orchestras and electronics, so there's a lot of electronic elements in there. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about We'll keep our uh, eyes and ears out for it, right? Yeah, so, so um, I've sort of done a lot of this uh, layering type of recording with um, orchestral music in the last few years, and uh, and it gives me a lot of control yeah. over over the every detail and the miking of each instrument and and uh, do you find you can kind of hear every player that way as well it doesn't just um yeah it 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 it's a little bit you can you can definitely get that big orchestral sound yes. um but you can also zoom in more yeah. easily and you can kind of get the kind of chamber music uh, quality a bit sure. more if uh, if you want um I was when when I hear things done that way, it always reminds me of a Ligeti piece, not not tonally, but right. in the sense of those huge stanzas where everyone is given a slightly yeah. different direction, exactly, and then, yeah. then you get the, the yeah. friction, you know. Yeah, and it's really useful for uh, scores that are written like that, where every where it's everything is divisi, and yeah. like, uh, almost every player has a different voice, so you would kind of want to. Uh, focus on each one. It, it's time consuming. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> what was your track? What was your biggest track count? Well, I've. Um, I was trying to. I was running some stuff through. Um, like some stuff through distortion and recording it back in. And I ran out of track, so I don't know what that means. So I got all this the, I'm using all the tracks. Lot. I'm using <laughs> all, all of, the tracks. What was your biggest track count? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alex. Pleasure. It's brilliant.